Hey, welcome to another video. Rob here. Um, we're getting back into the classic X-Men issue 34, continuing and finishing the Proteus saga, at least from the issues that um, I have. I, I missed the uh, uh, first issues of the story, but I got enough of it to kind of get the basic gist of the story. I remember reading this um, as a kid and found it really interesting. It's one of those things where I didn't realize how interesting I was really finding it to be until retrospect many years later when I think back on it and how much I thought about the story and it defined and described who the X-Men were in so many ways with these very early stories. <coughs> Excuse me. So revisiting these has been an absolute joy in a way that I did not expect. I kind of started these with just the idea of looking at some of these old books and the weird idea of Marvel printing a book, classic X-Men, just repackaging old books and putting them out there. It's such a weird concept, but um, it was so formative in my um, comic reading early years to get to read these old stories that had already happened and um, get caught up with some of the best stories, the best X-Men stories ever told. So these have been quite a joy. And, um, I, I haven't seen this issue in years and years and years, I mean decades. And so I just got done flipping through it real quick just to kind of re-familiarize myself with the material before I flip through it and speak on it. It's funny how many things are in here that, for example, I just recently did a video on the first comic book I ever drew for myself. And having flipped through this, it's funny how many separate little panels and figures um, I pulled from this book specifically for that comic that I did of my own. Um, so clearly it influenced me a lot in when I was 14 years old or so to get into these books. So anyway, great cover. Again, the original cover um, is this right here. And again, that's good. But this guy they had doing new covers for the series, the Steve Lytle, man, he just brought something that was just a more contemporary and powerful image that works better. Got Wolverine up here with all the X-Men lying dead, but Colossus standing triumphant. Uh, let's see what goes on. Let's check it out. If you uh, remember the previous issues from the other two videos that I've done on the classic X-Men, this mutant Proteus who able, who's able to possess bodies. He's uh, now t possessed the body of his father, and his mutant powers are the ability to warp reality and change it into anything he wants. He can, I don't know, what are they saying? Watch when he can spin. Oh, it's so I'm so dumb. I'm trying to quote Watchmen. I can't even remember. Spinning, like, what, wine into gold or something like that? Like, literally taking any kind of um, matter and rearranging it to be anything he wants. So that's a pretty powerful, pretty dangerous power set. So this is kind of just recapping what was going on. And this is, so obviously, like I was saying, this is Proteus who can possess body. So he's possessing his father's body, and that's his mother. And um, she's screaming, I'm trying to get the situation under control. Here come the X-Men charging in to save the day. And like I said, how I just revisited this issue for the first time in years. So many of the images in these panels, in this entire thing, once I've seen them again, it's crazy to me how familiar they are in the recesses of my memories without even realizing it. And once I see him again, I'm like, oh my God, right. This issue was so important because it was the culmination of this big story. Like how, again, reality is being warped and like this brick wall is coming down to smash this woman and a baby and Cyclops is blasting it out of the way. Phoenix is pulling somebody out of harm's way. Um, Nightcrawler's um, grabbed onto, I think a child. She's commenting, you're blue. What's going on? Who are you? And um, this is a crazy panel where Proteus is turning this the ground into a swarm of bees and Storm is talking about how she has to save these people from a swarm of bees or they'll suffer a horrendous death, yet she doesn't want to kill the bees. You know, she's got a real strong sense of preserving life. She doesn't want to kill. <clears throat> this panel right here, um, Wolverine slashing away debris from this old lady. Um, this is... Uh, one of those images, this little tiny thing right here, this old woman is one of the pictures I stole from my own, um, that comic of my own that I drew forever ago. It's funny when I saw that. And I, when I look at the way this page layout is done, modern 90s artists at the time in the 90s would make this panel of Wolverine slicing shit be like three quarters of the whole page because everyone got into this 
this this thing of making Wolverine a big, awesome, powerful image, what Jim Lee would do, what Mark Silvestri would do. I'm not saying that as a negative. I like it. But I have a more of a, it's more interesting, more balanced, and more a team book when he's not the sole crazy focus all the time. He's just a member of the team doing what he does. No more or less important than Storm or Cyclops or Jean Grey. So that's just an interesting kind of little side note where he's just slashing some debris away, saving this old lady. But a modern comic would have this be a giant panel of Wolverine just looking incredibly awesome. I remember this panel where like the ground is being lifted up from under him. This drawing of him kind of hunched over as the ground is falling out from under him. He's he's not digging it at all. Wolverine's saying how he's, for the first time in his life, he's running from a fight and he's kind of glad. This is just not something that he can really deal with very easily, the reality warping. So this page, it gives a basic recap of the origin of the Proteus guy, how he was imprisoned and in a battle between the X-Men smashed into the mechanics of it and freed him from his jail cell but they didn't know it so this was him in his original body he possesses a guy he gets away and um you know he, he attacks phoenix but phoenix almost kills him and then these are the various bodies he's taken over just recapping his story so if this is the first time you've picked this up or in the case of me started in the middle this gives you history you didn't know up until a point where you you catch up um, again, Moira, the mother, is trying to talk him down, and he's just laughing. Like, he's warping her, changing her into, like, weird different animals just to torture her. It's, uh, you know, pretty violent and pretty horrifying in a way. I have to say, um, I've no something I noticed looking through these issues... Not looking at in each individual panel... This is kind of hard for me to explain. I've tried to thought about how to explain this, but... But just looking at the art as a spread, every double page, you know, opening up every page and all this art, the panel layouts, the colors, the compositions, just it looks like the most perfect comic book I've ever seen. It doesn't have big, over-the-top, flashy 90s, like, indulgence art. It's just pure, perfect storytelling with interesting characters and compositions and colors and Everything about it, it just looks good. I don't know if that makes any sense. Because um, it's not like I'd sit down a comic that I picked up off the shelf today and be like, this looks bad. It, it's not, that's not what I mean. But something about this just looks so, cla like, perfect, classic comic book. I don't know if that makes any sense. I hope it does. But anyway, continuing with the story, um, you know, the townspeople are running away trying to, as the X-Men are trying to figure out how they're going to stop him they're having debates on how are they going to do they might have to kill him he cyclops is saying he'll sacrifice all the x-men's lives if he has to and um but that's just what they have to do this is this is this is life or death this guy is so dangerous and they're saying proteus has two weaknesses metal and his need for fresh body so they gotta make him burn out his current body to get the opportunity to take him out uh, here you see the bad guy, Proteus, in a silhouette of Storm approaching. She throws a foggy mist around him and um, hoping to disorient him. But he's like, nope, I got you. I know where you're at. So he makes her cape. Um, he reshapes her cape and encases her in solid amber, like just a b block of crystal. She's stuck. And Wolverine here is debating. He's like, she's going to suffocate and die in seconds. I have to get her out. But if I do, he's like, I turn my back on him. And he could get me, but I can't let her die. Like, it's a horrible choice he has to make. But honestly, there's only one choice. He starts cutting her out. He's like, I'll get you out. Even if he has to turn his back on the biggest threat they've ever faced. And to his credit, he gets her out really quick, but she's not breathing. So here comes Proteus. He's like, I'm going to get, I'm going to take you out. Maybe take over her body. Boom. He gets shot in the shoulder. It's Banshee. He's uh, taking a shot. He's pointing out, dude, you should have shot me in the head. You should have gone for the head, buddy. Like, we all need to learn that lesson. Um, so I thought this was a really awesome series. There's a whole series of awesome events and depictions of mutant superpowers in this book that are so good. And they've had plenty to start. But this is another one where, again, he can re warp reality. So you got Banshee who just shot him. So he just opens a vast chasm underneath Banshee 
and Banshee falls into it to who knows how, like probably forever, and seals it back up under him. Like what a quick way just to eliminate a threat. Boom, there's a pit under you and seals it up. So Cyclops starts blasting down to cut a hole down to him and then tells Nightcrawler, get down there and pull him out. I don't know how Cyclops was able to blast perfectly down to the spot where he was at and stop without hitting him, whatever. Nightcrawler, Nightcrawler grabs him and as he's crawling and to pull him out, the, the tunnel starts sealing up around him. So Nightcrawler basically has to do a blind teleport, which he does not like to do. He can only really go where he's been before and where he's seen. And he can teleport, but if he's going somewhere he's never seen, who knows where he ends up. So he teleports up there. The strain almost kills them both, but he gets stopped in midair. It's Polaris. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head what her relation to Magneto is, but she has magnetic powers like Magneto. So anyway, she catches them, drops them on the ground, Cy or Nightcrawler's wiped out, and Cyclops like, just rest easy, you're fine. Um, uh, Storm, she's barely getting back up, she's fine, she didn't suffocate. And uh, again, they're talking about what what do we, uh, the, you know, Proteus is stronger than ever, like what do we do? Um, so he said, I set Phoenix ahead, let's get after her. So this is an interesting thing. I don't know if it reads, you can tell here, but Proteus is able to just, with again, warping reality, he just has the ground picking him up and just rocketing him around the, the ground, the, the, the surface. Like he just stands on this piece of earth and just has it slide along the ground to get him back and forth. He gets zapped right here. He drops Moira and there's Phoenix. Again, if you know Jean Grey as Phoenix, she is one of the most powerful characters in all of comics, in the Marvel comics. This is a really interesting way to portray her attacking him. She's not zapping him. It's like she's just kind of like coming down on him. Her just energy is encasing him. Like you completely get it. It completely reads. But if I were to read a script and say, have Phoenix attacking the bad guy, I would never think to draw this. And I'm going back to again how comics in the future with the Jim Lees and Mark Silvestri's would lay out things differently with that, that anchor image concept where a big portion of the page would be a big image showcasing this, having her look sexy and having him reeling in pain in a much bigger image and then fit all the rest of it in panels below. But again, looking at a perfectly beautifully laid out comic book, colors, composition, even though it's a small corner at the top, like a quarter of the page, it reads perfectly. And then, it, I, I hope that makes sense. I wonder if any of you artists out there or readers or anybody, under, if I'm making any sense of what I'm talking about, but it just looks so great. Um, Proteus fights back. He lashes out at her. Um, you could, This is a, you know, in shadow up on a tree. It's Wolverine obviously saying how he's, you know, he's proud of her for getting really aggressive. Um you know, she's not holding back. It says here, imagine being dead and buried and then imagine how you'd feel, assuming you could feel, after a year in the ground. That's how Proteus makes Phoenix feel. Her scream is indescribable. I thought this drawing was pretty dang good. It's got the kind of sexy female figure without being exaggerated, but then drawing the skeleton, so that's hard. But to show her kind of reeling in pain down to her core, like suffering the pain of death. That's the only way you're gonna stop Phoenix. Here comes a classic Wolverine move that gets more uh, exaggerated as the years goes on. But he jumps down into it. He's like, dude, don't you hurt her. I loved her. I'll see you dead before you hurt her again. Big swa, you know, slicing, gutting him. In theory, being he's um, metal is deadly to him, this should have been the end of the story. Um, if one just stabbed him and not slashed him. But... The story must go on. But a great drawing, that angry face on Wolverine's sl slashing claws and a big enough panel to, in, to get the idea, but it's not a giant panel. Perfectly balanced, beautifully drawn. It's so good. So the rest of the X-Men, or at least some of them, you got the Cyclops and Havoc show up. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, Cyclops and Havoc are brothers. And so Wolverine's grabbing onto Moira to get her out of there. He's reeling in pain, the Proteus is. So this is another cool thing where Cyclops and Havoc blast him at the same time. And this this is a great drawing. I'm going to bring it a little closer to the camera. Like the way that John Byrne depicted him getting hit. Like he's not getting vaporized, but he's certainly suffering. And they're saying how it's crazy how he's resisting. Like what does it take to stop him? Meanwhile, Wolverine's like, 
crawling up a hill trying to get her out of the way. Proteus just dissolves himself into nothing, and so their powers now go through him, and they hit each other. But the thing about Cyclops and Havoc is they're able to basically absorb each other's powers, and it doesn't hurt them. Here's another one of those scenes with Proteus and the ground just launching him into the air. He just warps reality just to lift him super fast. Like in this panel, he's just rocketing up. He can't fly, but he doesn't need to. Wolverine's saying here how Proteus must be doing something with gravity because he can't move. Like, he's coming like a rocket and he can't move anywhere. Proteus grabs Moira, Wolverine falls. Here's another one of those. Like, this was another great example of how they use their powers, a depiction visually of great use of power. This is another great one. You know, Colossus and Cyclops are like, shit, Wolverine's falling from that high. He may not survive. So Cyclops does this, like, pulse blast where he just blasts it and, like, zap, 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 just bumping into him, just stopping him slowly in, 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 in moments, like one, two, three, a couple of bumps to slow his fall, and then a last one, pff, just so Wolverine doesn't fall to his death, and, you know, Wolverine's grateful, he's like, I'm going to be black and blue forever, but I think that was a great, like, Cyclops is an awesome leader, I mean, he, I, this is like, I think, the prime best version of him, and the way that they wrote him and portrayed his powers he cares about his team. He saves them. He looks after them. He makes the hard decisions. And what a great use of powers. Great drawing. Great storytelling. It's just so good. It's so great. Proteus, now he's back up here. Um, his body's super rotting. He's going to get Moira. He's cackling on about how, you know, evil bad guy shit doing evil bad guy stuff. Um, Got to mention a couple of panels here. This here and this here, both I ripped off and put into my own stupid comic book back in the day. I completely forgot about this until I looked into it uh, just a little bit before recording this video. And once I saw it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's where I got some of these things from my own comic. Anyway, enough about that. The body is rotting, but Colossus got up here. He's still in his human form. He just grabs him and throws him. And he's such a rotted corpse at this point when he slams into the wall. It says his body just shatters and decays into powder. Now he's just this white glowing energy shape. And, um, you know, Colossus is thinking to himself, like, well, I mean, this is probably his most dangerous and his most vulnerable. But Proteus makes fire, you know, zip, zip around Colossus. Um, I don't know how he survives that being human, whatever. But he's reeling in pain. And this is great. This is Colossus was never the star of anything in these early. He was a great supporting character. It was the Cyclops show as the leader with Professor X. Storm was a leader and an amazingly interesting character in the books. Wolverine was the badass. Colossus was just the tall, strong guy. But he has a great moment here. He's saying, I hear you, Butcher, in my, inside my mind, laughing. You enjoy causing pain, death. Before I met you, I never understood evil. You are evil, Proteus, but you have made a fatal mistake. You toyed with me when you should have slain me, allowing me time to change from Peter Rasputin to Colossus. That mistake will be your last. I love this intensity, the energy crackling to show him turning into like his metal form. What a great drawing. And then he slams his metal fist into the energy body of Proteus. Again, another great depiction of the powers. Just great. So metal is deadly to Proteus. Great. Now here's the use of a big panel where you would have a big moment punctuated by dedicating a big chunk of the page to it. And you got the little drawing here. And I, I wonder how he did this. If he did black ink on the page and then went over with paint and scratch or something like that. It'd be really interesting to see the original artwork. But looking at it up close, let me see if we can't. It's, I mean, it's crappy old comic newsprint. But to me, this looks like paint strokes. White out, paint, who knows what. So that's what I'm guessing, that it was black and then he painted it in. Um, this is the death of the mutant Proteus and from down below. Cause again, they, they went way up there, the Colossus and Proteus. So the X-Men are down here like, holy shit, I, whatever's going on. I hope Colossus is surviving. Cyclops is asking Jean, can you fly us up there? And she's like, I think I can. I'll give it a try. It says here how she's like actually surprised how easy it is. I just thought this was kind of a fun panel with these side views of them flying up there, showing the height. I mean, Wolverine is always supposed to be short. They've got that height difference in there. So they land and they're like, Hey, uh, I don't see Proteus. Where is he? And Colossus is saying, don't worry, he's gone. You know, we, I did what we had to do. And he, this is 
kind of a funny moment. He's like, Moira, I have no words to comfort you because, again, Proteus was her son. I have no words to comfort you, only my strength. Do not hold back your tears, small one. I will not rust. So he's like, go ahead and cry. I'm not going to rust. Um, I like this. Wolverine's like, hey, good job, dude. I couldn't have done it better myself. And I like how he like, kind of gives him a little bump on the shoulder, but it's like metal bones hitting metal body. You know, it's like metal hitting metal. Kang is the little sound effect they throw in there. Um a great moment for Colossus because, again, he was never the star of anything, but he was a very interesting character. He's the big, tall guy, super muscular, the strongest, practically invulnerable, but he's a peaceful man. He's an artist. He's got a, like an artistic soul. He likes to paint and draw. He sees the beauty in life. So he'll fight, but he doesn't want to kill. He's never killed as far as I know, but he had to. And he, he did what he had to do. And it's a great moment to make the character stand out and be great. So they're kind of reminiscing here about, well, that sucks. You know, they're dead. We all went through horrible things. They kind of stand around like, you know, we did what we had to do. We survived as a team. 17 pages. Again, the amount of story that they got into these issues is just shocking to me. It's so good. It's like perfect storytelling, perfectly laid out. The writer knew what he was doing. Chris Claremont, obviously. I mean, the one critique I would have with Claremont is weird run-on, not weird, but just run-on run on stories that never seemed to ever wrap up because it was always continuing on next, what's next, what's next, what's next. And way more verbal than it needed to be, but it somehow worked. And this is peak first-rate X-Men right here. So great stuff. So that's the wrap-up of the Proteus story. Um, I really enjoyed it. And starting next issue, I believe, starts the Dark Phoenix Saga, which is great. I am really excited to get into that. But again, as is the case with these uh, classic X-Men, there's a backup story that's added. Um, this one, again, it's new material for this book. So, I mean, this was printed in 1989. So, you know, that's when this was originally made. But written by Anne, written by Anne Nascenti and John Bolton again. Um very interesting. Once I saw this, again, I'm like, oh, right, I remember seeing this. And as a young man, you're seeing this type of stuff. You are you can't help but be like, uh, okay, you got my attention. Um, this is um, Jason Wingard, uh, mastermind, they call him, a uh, major character in the upcoming Dark Phoenix saga. But he's sitting here thinking to himself how the Hellfire Club is decadent and ridiculous and he's talking about he refers to as this awkward brainless trollop she's just so she, she's he's like she's just nothing to me she's exposed and it's embarrassing for her and you can tell he is just kind of like looking at her as an object just her body she's saying do you need anything else and she's sir and he just silently sits and stares at her like she's a nothing you know very uncomfortable for her so she is wandering in the back. So I guess I should say, if you don't know, she's uh, the other guy, Jason Wingard. He's in the Hellfire Club. Uh, I'm not sure what their history of is with the X-Men up to this point, but I know that they're a group of mutants that are extremely powerful and they dress in this ridiculous way, old timey, sexualized, and they have big plans to take on the X-Men. I guess this is a girl who's trying to join the club and she's sitting here saying how like she's what am i doing here this stupid place this outfit everything feels wrong that man is horrible how he stares at me it's embarrassing it's humiliating so she runs into emma frost i don't know if i've ever seen her before this issue this might have been the first time i ever saw emma frost who's the white queen <clears throat> but it's a good bit of characterization to introduce you to her this girl's trying to tell don't you just hate wearing these outfits it's like we're being gaped at it's rude um, this job, the, the, the place is obscene. It's disgusting. It's, it's, isn't it sexist? Should we protest? We should be valued for our skills, not how we look, right? Should we like stand together and refuse to do this? And she's like, what are you going on? I'm like, shut up. Who do you think I am? Just another servant. I'm the white queen. Yeah. You wear that outfit and men look at you and it cheapens you. She's like, yeah, this is what we do. She says, but when I wear it, it cheapens them. Let me explain a few things about sexism, girl. It's all in what you use it for. The Hellfire Club reeks of desire and ambition for success and world domination, but it's really about personal domination. My clothes are my battle armor. I dress to go to war. My looks and body are weapons on par with a man's fists. 
She says, I go to do battle now. She's like, you may come and watch and service drinks, but you will not see much. As with the samurai, one look tells who is the superior fighter. The best swords stay in their scabbard. So I'm sure this girl's like, what in the holy hell of shit is she talking about? But she's like, I'm going to go into battle. Do you want to come watch? So she just gives her more of her like bullshit villain stuff. And this girl's like, you're all are horrible. And she's like, yeah, we're, we're the Hellfire Club. What the hell do you think we what, where, where we are? So she joins the room with Jason Wingard. There's a chess table. And he says, a game? And she says, quite. And you got the chess pieces here. And then, again, this story suddenly goes into this really weird thing where it gives John Bolton the uh, opportunity to do some really weird shit. Basically, it's saying how they just stare at each other. It's a mind war. It's a, in, their, in their minds having a battle of chess, just staring at each other. He's the Black King. She's the White Queen, obviously. This is her piece. That's his. Little demure little figure, big, violent, monstrous guy. She leaves herself open. He strikes. What a crazy, weird drawing. Big eyes, the teeth. It's really interesting. So, again, the mind war commences. He attacks, <clears throat> knocks her over. She falls quite a long ways and shatters. So he, being overconfident, jumps down. She's down here with his, his long weapon that she that fell with her. She points it up and stabs him. He's dead, but now his body sliding down that pole splatters both of them, and they're both done. And it goes back to that girl watching them. She's like, look, they're just staring at each other. They're not moving the pieces. This place is horrifying. And she's just looking. They're just sitting here staring at the table. I think that's another great visual representation of what they're doing. They're just sitting here staring at nothing, but this is what's going on in their mind. And so he's like, good game, a draw for now. So just mind war, you know, a really interesting way to show that, that, um, that little side story gets him into some characterization of who and what they are. I thought that was pretty good. And again, another example of John Bolton doing weird stuff, ads for different things. Nothing is interesting, as interesting as the comic. There's the back cover, another great weird drawing with this crazy design really neat but the best part classic x-men the end of the proteus saga remember like i say this all the time reading this as a kid holy shit comics were good they weren't always part of these giant crossovers and super big events they just let the artist and the writer tell the story and let it go on the way they wanted to and develop the characters and you got really invested if you found a book that you connected with and man did this grab me fast so great story great art i know i keep repeating myself but it is what it is. So that's Classic X-Men number 34. Thank you for joining me. Uh, next time we'll get into um, what I believe is the beginning of the uh, Dark Phoenix saga. It's a, what, a five or six issue um, run. So some material to go over there. So um, that's all I've got for now. I was really looking forward to get to this one. I should be in bed. I should be asleep. But I'm like, you know what? I got to record this. I got to get it ready so I can get this uploaded. So um, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. I've been getting uh, quite a few uh, followers, um, something like four or five a day. It's weird how it's been going. Um, again, I've only been doing this about five weeks now, and um, it's it's going really well. I'm having a lot of fun. Thank you for your interactions, your comments. Um, I appreciate it, everybody. So um, that's all for now, and I will see you next time. Thanks. Bye.